There was once a kingdom here, deep in the deserts of China's far west. In ancient times, it was known as Kucha. For more than a thousand years, it was a proud and mighty kingdom. Then, some 1,500 years ago, it suddenly and mysteriously vanished, almost as if it had crumbled into the dust of the desert, leaving behind hardly a trace, save a few weathered and wind-sculpted ruins. To this day, much about this long-lost kingdom remains shrouded in mystery. We do not even know for certain the identity of the people who established this kingdom and where they came from, nor do we know much about their way of life and culture. Intriguing questions also hang over the role this kingdom played as a bridge between the East and West. The emergence of Kucha as an independent kingdom can be dated back to around 200 BC. Because it occupied a pivotal position on the Silk Road running the length of the Eurasian continent, Kucha became a meeting place of cultures, a melting pot of civilizations. But that pivotal position brought danger too. Control of the strategically positioned kingdom meant control of the Silk Road. It soon became the focus of conflict. In 77 BC, a war between two of the great powers of the day took place on its territory. The first step taken by the Han Empire was to station troops in the west. Garrisons were established in Luntai and Yuli, but these were not simply military bases. They were also self-supporting agricultural communities. Soon they were ready to move against a kingdom called Koran. In 77 BC, the commander of the Han forces, Ho Guang, sent his envoy Fu Jiazhe and a guard of more than 20 warriors to the palace of Koran. The pretext of the visit was to present gifts to the Koran king. Instead, Fu Jiazhe left the royal palace with a gift for his emperor, the head of Koran's king. The impact of the shock decapitation of their king on the Korans was immediate. They swore allegiance to the Han Emperor. The fall of Koran left Kucha exposed. Meanwhile, the Xuangnu saw that their position was rapidly deteriorating. They urged the king of Kucha to do something. The latter decided on a preemptive strike. He would destroy the Han garrison before it got too powerful. Untai was their first target. The Han commander, Lai Dan, was killed in the fighting. With 50,000 Han soldiers on his doorstep, the king of Kucha was in a tricky situation. His defense was that Lai Dan's murder was committed during the reign of the late king, his father. He, the new king, unlike his father, had always admired the civilization of the Han. Unlike his predecessors, the new king was determined not to be in an equivocal position. He declared allegiance to the Han dynasty. The king opened the gates of Kucha to the Han army. The man who murdered Lai Dan was handed over to Chang Hui for punishment. Xiao
He was the first Cochin king to marry a Han princess and support Han efforts to unify the Far West. In 60 BC, the Xiongnu surrendered. After this capitulation, the Han Emperor established a protectorate over these Western kingdoms. The integration of the West into the Han Empire ushered in a period of unprecedented prosperity for Kucha. Subsequent Chinese were equally keen to control Kucha. Its unique geographical position gave it a vital strategic significance, but rival powers were not slow to recognize the importance of the kingdom. Whereas the Xiongnu competed with the Chinese for control of the territory during the Qin and Han dynasties, during the Sui and Tang dynasties, the Chinese vied with the Tibetans and various Turkic peoples. However, China's control over the region was uncertain. The fall of a dynasty in China or a rebellion in one of the kingdoms often led to a diminution of Chinese influence in the area. This is perhaps one of the reasons why Kucha remained unstable throughout much of its history. In 16 CE, war broke out in the region once again when General Li Chong launched a punitive campaign against the state of Yanxi, known as Karashar in Uyghur language. It was a war of revenge. The protectorate general was in charge of the Chinese protectorate over the kingdoms. He was the representative of the emperor and the supreme political authority in the far west. In 13 CE, Dan Qin, the 17th protector general of the west, was killed by a Yanqi raiding party. Li Chong, his successor, was tasked with restoring the prestige of the Chinese in the region. The first task was to punish Yanqi for the insolent raid that cost the life of Li Chong's predecessor. He assembled a force of 7,000 that included not just Han soldiers, but also troops from the kingdoms of Kucha and Sacha. Unfortunately, the march on Yanqi was a fiasco. Li Chong's army was unable to take the Yanqi by surprise. Instead, the Han army fell victim to an ambush in which the commander of the expedition himself, General Wang Jun, was killed. Of the 7,000 soldiers who marched on Yanqi, only 500 managed to limp back to Kucha. In 1928, archaeologist Huang Wenbi began excavating ruins in Yuchikata town, Xinhe County, Xinjiang. In history, this place was a part of the kingdom of Kucha. When they came across this city with its walls crumbling into the sand, it was difficult for people to believe that this was ever the heart of a prosperous civilization. It was difficult to see how these tumble-down ruins in the middle of nowhere could be of any significance whatsoever. However, it was here that an important discovery was made by Hong Wen Bi and his team. It was a bronze seal. Even more significantly, it was the seal of Li Chong himself. The question was, how did it end up here? To locals, Uchikata is known as the City of Three Layers. Some historians speculate that it was the seat of the Protectorate General back in the days of the Han Dynasty. When Li Chong's army limped into Kucha, Li Chong consoled himself that it was only a matter of time before his enemies were brought to heel. For eight years, Li Chong administered his protectorate over the West from Kucha. His period of office probably represents the nadir of Han influence over the Western regions. His term of office came to an end when the Yanxi army laid siege to Kucha. It's said that Li Chong and his followers fought to the last man. The discovery of his seal in Yuchikata was a melancholy reminder of this tragic episode in history.
Li Chong was the 18th protector general who served under the Western Han Dynasty. He was also the last. For the next half century, the imperial authorities had difficulty asserting influence in the far west. All that changed when General Ban Chao restored the Kucha Protectorate. A reminder of this change of fortune in the affairs of state came in July 2007 when construction workers chanced upon an ancient tomb. It was not, of course, the first time that an old, seemingly forgotten tomb had been unearthed. But these tombs were different. In form, they were similar to those in Dunhuang. It was the first time a classic Han tomb that could be dated back to such an early period had been found in the region. But archaeology had more surprises up its sleeve. We think it was three or two stones. The first one is more and more. The first one is more and more. The first one is more and more. 十一座墓完了之后呢，就是我们就是准备要建博物馆，呃，这个设计都做完了，就准备要建了。就是在这个挖基础的时候，挖墙的基础的时候，在这个基础刚好基础上又出现了四座墓。The discovery of the ancient tombs and grave goods confirms the long-standing relationship between Central China and its far west regions. It also confirms that the political turbulence that engulfed China from the 3rd to the 6th centuries caused large numbers of Chinese to move westwards. The likelihood is that this was a family burial vault. Generation after generation of the same family were buried here. More than 1,000 years ago, in the time of the Jin Dynasty, Generations of Han people had already lived and died here and transformed the land into their ancestral home. Kuchu was the place they called home, a kingdom of rivers, grasslands and mountains, an oasis in the desert. The sand still bears witness to their story. The first men to discover the contents of these tombs were grave robbers. In the 1990s, they dug into the tomb and took whatever they could lay their hands on. The extent of the loss to the archaeological community remains unknown. When the hole made by the grave robbers was discovered, an official excavation began. Regrettably, they were too late. The damage had been done. A few coins and some pottery shards were all that was left. However, it wasn't all bad news. The few coins encouraged further archaeological excavation. The result was the discovery of a hoard of 3,000 coins. The markings on some of these coins were of exceptional interest. Some of the coins bore the name Da Li, others Jiang Zhong, the regal names of Tang Dynasty emperors. 
However, there was something puzzling about the coins. There is no record of any coins like these ever having been minted. Also, the copper used to mint the coins was not of high quality, certainly not up to the usual standard of Tang Dynasty coins. Some people speculate that these coins were minted locally. If so, who made the coins and why? The Tang Dynasty was one of the most powerful dynasties in Chinese history. It was during this period that the West once more became part of China. Kucha, the headquarters of the Protector General, became caught up in the prolonged struggle between the Tang Empire and Tibet. Constant conflict between all the different Western statelets and kingdoms meant the authority of the Tang Protector General was rather shaky. Rebellions resulted in the loss of Kucha on a number of occasions. In 755, An Lushan, commander of Fanyang, Pinglu, and Hudong regions, rebelled against the Tang Dynasty. For 35 days, he swept all before him and stormed Luoyang, the second city of Tang, China. His next target was the capital itself, Chang'an. The kings and rulers of the states that had pledged allegiance to the emperor rallied to the emperor's defense and rushed to Chang'an. <laughs> The march to the capital, however, had consequences of its own. The western borders were denuded of troops. Tibet took advantage of this momentary weakness to put pressure on the Tang Empire. With next to nothing standing in their way, they took control of the Gansu Corridor. Kucha was now cut off from the rest of China. At this critical moment, the defense of Kucha fell to Gou Xin, nephew of famous general Gou Zhe'i. With no possibility of reinforcements coming to his aid, Gou Xin and his army were on their own. They would have to hold back the Tibetan onslaught single-handedly. For the next 16 years, they were cut off from the rest of the empire. These coins could be a poignant symbol of that isolation. Inferior copper representing their lack of access to the resources of the center and the emperor's name, their enduring loyalty.
In 2003, Sheng Chun Lin, the deputy county chief of Xinhua, hand in hand with the country's cultural relics bureau and the Xinjiang Institute of Archaeology, initiated a systematic survey of the sites associated with ancient Kucha. Archaeological excavation, aerial photography, and geophysical surveys revealed the true extent of the territory of the ancient Kucha kingdom. A chain of historical sites reveals the complex defense system that existed during the time of the Tang dynasty. Tongguzhu Bashi, the ancient fortress where the coins were found, is located at the very center of this defensive system. Interestingly, the name of the fortress confirms this discovery. Bashi, uh, to use the word 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 to use the 周长也就是二百多米，不到三百米。但是通古斯巴西古城呢，它将近是一千米。In 1928, a Chinese archaeologist called Huang Wenbi surveyed this site. He concluded that during the Tang Dynasty, it was an important military base. Self-sufficiency lay at the heart of military policy during the Tang Dynasty. Armies stationed in the West were obliged to raise crops and livestock as well as perform their military duties. Huang Wenbi's conclusion was based on several documents unearthed here. One document records that a loan of wheat and millet made by Chai Mingyi to Li Mingda in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Daizong. Another document records a man called Bai Subili collecting his rice ration from the garrison. It is perhaps significant that Bai Subili is not a Chinese name. Hong Wenbi believed that this was evidence that the garrison had resorted to recruiting locals, pointing to Kucha's long isolation from the rest of the Tang Empire. So, we chose Jun, Tada Tuntian Lai Shodawa, Vaisian Jiza Jose, your Arshitun, Shijis, Sung Woman Kaku Diota Lai Shona, Yuan Yuan de Buchi Arshitun. In December 2005, the archaeologists moved the focus of their survey to the desert to the south. The purpose of their expedition was to excavate Feng Shui ruins. They had no idea what lay in store for them. By a lake, they identified the desiccated remains of grapevines. These, together with the result of the analysis of the pottery shards found in the vicinity, were a clear indication that this was the site of a Tang Dynasty vineyard. We found that there were many trees in the top. Fields like these provided the troops stationed here with food. However, archaeological evidence pointed to the existence of a greater degree of self-sufficiency. The troops didn't just grow their own food, they also bred their own horses, forged their own weapons, and minted coins. Eighty kilometers from Kucha is the site of a Tang city. It was known as Turku Sari to some of the locals and the city of Tong to the Chinese. Built on a stretch of grassland by a lake, this was the likely location of the army's horse breeding ranch.
，短时间内大量的军马支援秋思也是比较难。那么草湖这个地区，它要存放啊一定量的这个军队的这个军马，这是必然的，啊。因为吐蕃他从南边过来的话，他这个越不过这个塔克拉玛干沙漠呀，所以基于这几种原因，草湖地区它适合于大量的屯军马，呃，有它的一定的道理。Though Goshen's army achieved self-sufficiency in food and war horses, it nevertheless remained cut off from the center. Indeed, the markings on the coins they minted are a poignant reminder of this period of isolation. The stamp, Year 15, Dali, is a mistake. The fact is that the Dali period lasted only 14 years. The Tibetan blockade was so effective that the beleaguered garrison of Tong had absolutely no idea that Emperor Dai Zong had died and that the Dali period was over. Goshen repeatedly attempted to establish contact with the central authorities, but without success. Finally, in 781, when Guo's messengers skirted around the huge Uyghur Khaganate, word of the lost Tang army got through to Chang'an. As military governor, Guo Xin protected the remote vastness of the far west over 16 years, a remarkable achievement given his isolation. The news that the whole garrison had survived, cut off in the wilderness of the far west, left the whole court dumbfounded. For a country that had been riven with factions and torn apart by civil war, the example of Guo Xin and his loyal army was like a healing balm for the fragmented empire finding its feet under Emperor Dazong. Immediately, the emperor dispatched messengers bound for the far west. Guo Xin was to be promoted and his men richly rewarded. Sadly, in the end, the emperor's words of encouragement were just that, words. The emperor was embattled, desperate to save his tottering dynasty. In the end, it proved impossible to provide Guo Xin and his men with any practical support. The Tang Dynasty, the western part of the empire, was known as Anxi, meaning the pacified west. The reality of the situation, however, meant that this Tang Dynasty term only made sense as an ironic euphemism. The territory was hardly ever at peace. The last mention of Anxi in the annals comes in 790 AD. In this year, the Tibetans invade Anxi. Despite Uyghur reinforcements, all military efforts are in vain. The protector general is killed, and the land is overrun. No word of the place now reaches us. The question is, did Anxi fall right away, or did it hold on for a while as it did under the command of Guo Xin? From envoy Zhang Chan's initial contact with the Kuchians to Li Chong's valiant death before the gates of the city, from Ban Chao's unification of Western kingdoms and statelets, to the beleaguered Guo Xin's loyal last stand, this place was more than a far-off place they were sent to guard. It was home, the land that supported them in life, the earth that provided the last resting place for their bones.
Located in an oasis nurtured by the Tarim River, Kucha was lucky to survive the centuries of war and conflict. In due course, it became an important stop on the Silk Road. Times of peace and prosperity allowed civilizations to blend here. It is in these periods that we begin to see just how fertile this blend could be. The Buddhist grottos of Kucha are just one of the fruits of this marriage of culture. The Kozil Caves is another example. Kozil means red and Uyghur, is located on the northern bank of the Muzat River, 65 kilometers west of Kucha. This warren of 236 caves and grottos in the cliffs of Mount Chatterdag stretches for two kilometers. It is one of the earliest major sites associated with Buddhism in China. These grottos begin to appear in the third century, a century earlier than the Mogao caves in Dunhuang Gansu. It is believed that Buddhist anchorites from far and wide carved out this underground temple. They were devotees of Hinayana branch of the Buddhist faith, emphasizing a personal quest for spiritual enlightenment that involved meditation, self-denial, and separation from worldly affairs. Their example inspired many people, but was particularly felt among the nobility. Cave number 205 contains images of these monks' patrons. They are extravagantly dressed and bedecked in jewelry. They also wear swords. Yet despite their apparent worldliness, each has a halo. In the In another cave, texts written in the Kuchin language have been found. One of these lists these patrons. Included in the list are six kings of Kucha, and the name of the queen of one of these kings appears on the mural in cave number 205. This indicates that this grotto was sponsored by a king of Kucha, Totika, and dedicated in the name of his wife, Queen Siwa Palaba. In Xinjiang country, the Zhuanlong Wang, this is according to the Buddha, the Zhuanlong Wang and the Gaosang can have the power. So, the Zhuanlong Wang has the power. The Zhuanlong Wang has the power. The Zhuanlong Wang has the power. The construction of religious complexes like these required a society with a sound economic basis. From the 3rd to the 8th century, it was important for the royalty and nobility of Kuchin society to be associated with the construction of religious sites like these. The Kazil murals portray episodes in Buddhist history and the lives of important saints, as well as Buddhist teachings. Though more than a thousand years have passed since these murals were painted, their colors remain bright and vivid. Whose hand was responsible for these works of art? How is it that their brilliance has lasted to the present day? The mural of one of the caves portrays some particularly intriguing figures. One of them wears a black wig, almost Egyptian in style, and is holding a palette in one hand and a brush in another. It's a painter working on a mural. In cave number 212, there's a short inscription on the mural. It seems to be the signature of the painter of these murals by Manabadra from Syria. What was Assyrian doing all the way over in Kucha? 
Does his presence represent a one-off, or was there already a long-standing relationship between Syria and Kucha? The style of the murals in cave number 212 indicates the murals were painted at some point between the 6th or 7th century. Intriguingly, it was around this time that the Persian Sassanid Empire expanded into Syria. Is it too much of a stretch to imagine that this political convulsion explained the presence of this Syrian painter in Kucha? Was he a political refugee who fled along the Silk Road and eventually found work as a painter in faraway Kucha? Though it's possible that Kazil offered safe haven to people from various cultural backgrounds, it was in no sense a paradise. It had more than its fair share of problems. In 1912, in the aftermath of the overthrow of the Qing Dynasty, a German archaeologist called Albert von Lecoq rode into Kucha. He was heading for the Kazil Caves. When Lecoq finally got to the caves, what he saw shocked him. What he found especially shocking was the extreme familiarity of the faces and styles of clothing depicted in the murals. Lecoq wrote in his diary that these murals reminded him of medieval European art. The postures, the armor, the swords all made him feel as if he were in a Gothic tomb. For Lecoq, it was evidence that China's links with Europe could be traced back to classical antiquity, to the days of classical Greece and Rome. In the Kazil Caves, the murals not only feature images of Helios, the Greek god of the sun, and Selene, the Greek god of the moon, but also various figures from Indian mythology. Lecoq ordered 80 huge trunks in the Kucha County. Murals and carvings and other artifacts were removed from the caves, placed in the trunks, and shipped back to Germany. These murals, the very essence of the Kazil Caves, went on display in Berlin's Museum of Ethnology. This In 1961, China named the Forbidden City, the Mogao Gatos of Dunhuang, and the Kazil Caves the most important sites of cultural and historical significance in the country. Annually, the Kazil Caves receive more than 20,000 visitors. Although war, 
Religious conflict, natural erosion, and plunder have damaged the Kazil Caves and their amazing murals and carvings. They continue to inspire people. Whether their interests are purely historical or artistic, there is something they can draw from the caves. Wang Xiaoyun is a choreographer from the Xinjiang dance troupe. For decades, she's been studying the Xinjiang dances, especially Kuchian ones. She keeps coming back to Kucha County. The murals are the source of her inspiration. Beijing Art Director Zhang The colorful murals here intoxicated Wang Xiaoyun. When she saw the murals in cave number 38, Dance in the Heavenly Palace, she felt as if she had stumbled into Wonderland. The mural in this cave is so impressive that people call it a perfect place of dance and music. In the lower part of the dome, there is a mural featuring 28 separate figures, all paired, some playing instruments, others dancing. They are playing all the principal types of musical instruments. In these murals are 28 different types of recognizable musical instruments. These murals give us a unique snapshot of musical culture in ancient Kucha. In 568, a huge caravan departed from Kucha bound for Chang'an. It was the caravan of Princess Ashina, daughter of Muchan Chagan of the Goturks, who was betrothed to Emperor Wu of the Northern Zhou Dynasty. The princess's entourage included a troupe of 300 musicians and dancers, including Sujiva, the most famous pipa player of the kingdom of Kucha. Sujiba was born and raised in Kucha. His father was a musician famous throughout the far west. He taught Sujiba how to play the people, also known as the Chinese lute, at an early age. Muchan Chagan loved Sujiba and his music very much. 
which is why he ordered Sejima to accompany the princess to Chang'an. He was sure that such an accomplished musician was worth more than the canniest diplomat. Sejima served the court in Chang'an for 13 years. He and his troupe not only played in the royal palaces, but also in the streets. His music conquered the hearts of all in the capital city. In 581, the Sui dynasty came to power, bringing Sujiba's career as a court musician to an abrupt end. His music remained popular, though Sujiba himself was reduced to playing in inns and brothels to make a living from it. But three years after the founding of the Sui dynasty, Sujiba's life took another turn. For seven years, the court musicians racked their brains to come up with a better type of court music. Sadly, nothing came up to scratch. The emperor was not pleased. One day, Zhen Yi, one of the court musicians, was walking in the street. His brow furrowed as he pondered the vexing problem of a new style of courtly music. Suddenly, he heard the strains of a melody played on a pipa floating over from a nearby inn. He went over to find out more. It was none other than Sujiva. Inspired by Sujiva's music, Zhang Yi had hit upon a solution. Under Sujiva's instruction, Zhang Yi soon came up with a new type of music. Zheng Yi, he was very careful. He was in the car's wheels, and he was in the car's wheels. He was in the car's wheels, and he was in the car's wheels. The emperor approved of Zhang Yi's music reforms. For centuries afterwards, Zhang Yi's music was the basis of Chinese courtly music and exerted a profound influence on the development of Chinese music for many generations. However, the role of Sujiba and the ancient Kuchian should never be forgotten. History has witnessed the decline and fall of many kingdoms. Yet for those with eyes to see and ears to hear, they have not entirely vanished from the face of the earth. Their legacy lives on in art and music. And so it is with the kingdom of Kucha. Though its cities and temples have crumbled into dust, the faith that these people followed and spread, the dances they danced, the music they played, lives on as part of our culture and in traditions that thrive to this very day.